Um, okay, so I think we are uh, more or less ready to start. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Yvonne. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome uh, Steve Gerbin to, uh, to the CQP Colloquium this month. Um, uh, so I'll just do a very brief introduction for Steve, who probably requires very little introduction. Um, so uh, Steve joined the Yale faculty in 20, uh, 2001, where he's the Eugene Higgs Professor of Physics and Professor of Applied Physics. Um, from 2007 to 2017, he served at, as the Yale's uh, as Yale's deputy provost for research, overseeing a variety of different directions, in, including strategic planning for research, innovation, tech transfer, etc. At, at Yale University, um, Steve is a, really a core figure in circuit community, along with um, his colleagues Michelle Devery and Rob Shokov. Uh, uh, Steve actually co-developed circuit community as a field and, um, and the le leading architectures for constructing the quantum hardware for, um, for these uh, future quantum computers. Uh, in particular, we use, uh, uh, the team uses uh, this platform called superconducting microwave circuits. Uh, and I also just want to add that Steve's notes, uh, lecture notes at Le Juge is also really a very prominent introductory text that a lot of us uh, read and study when we start, uh, start in this field. Uh, since 2020, uh, Steve became the founding director of the co-design center for quantum advantage, one of the five national information science centers founded by the Energy uh, Department of Energy. Um, so thank you very much, Steve, for uh, giving this talk today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. It's a, a pleasure to, uh, to uh, well, be here, if only virtually. And uh, I want to talk to you about using boson sampling, counting microwave photons, um in the circuit qed architecture and using it for quantum simulations so let me just start with the, directly with the take-home message which is that um <clears throat> Quantum error correction and quantum simulations of physical models containing boson degrees of freedom are both vastly more efficient if your hardware actually contains boson degrees of freedom rather than just um, qubits. And uh, so I'm not really going to talk too much about bosonic quantum error correction, mostly about the technology and technical capabilities that you need to do simulations of molecular vibronic spectra. But um, let's start by just reminding ourselves of some some basic facts which that if I have a discrete variable system let's say uh, transmon qubits or some other kind of approximately two level system uh, then if you have n qubits your total Hilbert space uh, total number of um, states is two to the n and here for this example of three, um, qubits, you can label the states in the standard basis by the, um, the state of the individual qubits, and you can, you can number them according to the binary number that the state of the bits represents, running from zero to seven. A harmonic oscillator, which for us is going to be microwave photon modes in three-dimensional cavities or perhaps uh, modes of two-dimensional coplanar waveguide resonators uh, are harmonic oscillators. They have in principle an infinite number of states, uh, but if you use the lowest two to the n of those states, then you can represent or replace n qubits with a single degree of freedom that has a, a nice large um, 
Hilbert space, assuming you can uh, control it. So, um, so we're interested in building hybrid hardware that consists of both discrete variable, two level qubits, and continuous variable or harmonic oscillator or boson degrees of freedom, the sort of Traditional uh, circuit QED architecture is qubit dominant, discrete variable dominant. You have the quantum information stored in qubits and the communication and interaction among the qubits is mediated by virtual exchange of microwave photons through these boson degrees of freedom, but they're relatively passive. In uh, we're, we're trying to turn this picture around and make it CV dominant. That is, the information is stored in the superpositions of photon flux states in these high Q resonators, and uh, possibly in an error correcting code. And then the logical operations and interactions and transmission and control of these states is, is uh, achieved through ancilla objects, which up here were the qubits, and down here are simply controller objects, secondary objects. So People are familiar with the fact that quantum spins are easy to simulate with qubits because they are quantum spins. Fermions are hard because of uh, the minus sign you get uh, in the relative phase of two different paths to the same final state uh, when you permute the and the, which particle ends up where. It's less widely appreciated that bosons are also hard to simulate with um, qubits, the uh, and it's not it's partly because the boson number can be large, but remember that uh, n qubits can represent you know the first two to the n states of the boson mode, so that's pretty efficient. Um, but it's really hard actually because physically natural operators for oscillator Hamiltonians, like the coordinate B plus B dagger or the photon lowering operator B, are very, very unnatural and difficult to realize in qubits. So if you have a, a qubit state number seven that represents uh, seven bosons in this mode, and you apply the lowering operator to get to six, well, you have to flip one of the qubits in this representation, and you have to somehow have this square root of seven. But for other cases, you can have as many as all three of the bits flip. And so you have quite complex multi-qubit operations that are quite difficult to realize in practice. I mean, they're superpositions of complex multi-qubit operations with funny weights. And it's quite unnatural and difficult to realize those in a, in a qubit representation of boson modes. But of course, if you actually have a boson, then you you know you have direct physical access to these operators. So that's the basic idea. So uh, so we believe that if you could build an architecture that contains bosonic modes, they could be highly hardware efficient for simulation of physical systems that contain boson degrees of freedom, you know, lattice gauge theory, theories of phonons, um, polarons, um, spin boson models, uh, the Bose-Hubbard model that's of interest for in condensed matter physics. And the thing I'm going to talk to you about today is the, uh, eventually at the end, is quantum simulation of molecular uh, spectra.
And here's a review of some uh, ideas about quantum simulations with microwave light for bosonic systems. So let's start with experimental control and, me and measurement of hybrid discrete variable oscillator systems and to see what capabilities there are and then how we can utilize them in uh, quantum simulations. So we have some, let's say, three-dimensional microwave cavity, centimeter on the side. It has electric field oscillations from the photons in there. And there's, say, a transmon qubit uh, coupled to it. And the frequency of the transmon qubit is different from that of the cavity. The, the frequency of the qubit is, say, omega q, and the frequency of the cavity is omega c. And they're detuned by maybe 20%. As a result of that, the, they cannot directly exchange excitations and conserve energy. So they do so virtually. A photon can hop uh, from the cavity to the qubit, but has to quickly go back. But in second order perturbation theory, that produces this dispersive coupling uh, which uh, of strength chi, where this is the photon number, and this is the Pauli Z operator that tells you whether the qubit is in the ground or excited state. And this nonlinear interaction is what is going to give us universal control of uh, both the qubit and the harmonic oscillator. Uh, once we include the fact that we can apply microwave tones to drive the cavity and other microwave tones to drive, to Robbie flop the qubit. And this coupling uh, lets you displace the cavity conditioned on the state of the qubit and rotate the qubit conditioned on the state of the cavity. And you can prove that this Hamiltonian gives you um, universal control. So here's, a, here's an example of, uh, from the Sholkoff lab of this kind of universal control. There's a 3D resonator here. You can drive the cavity. There's a transmon, some secondary resonator, and you can drive the transmon. And if you apply this predetermined numerically computed waveform to the qubit and this to the cavity, you can drive the cavity from photon Fox state zero through some intermediate states 500 nanoseconds later to photon Fox state six. You cannot if you just apply a classical drive to such a cavity, you always produce a coherent state, which is a superposition of different photon numbers. To achieve a single, a non-Gaussian state, which is a, has a sharp photon number, requires some anharmonic or two-level ancilla system to give you the control you need. Uh, so here you see the measured Wigner function, which is a kind of quasi-probability distribution in phase space and position and momentum. And you see it's circularly symmetric because the number uncertainty is zero and the phase uncertainty is two pi. And here you see the measured number distribution. The Wigner function is a very convenient way to do um, state tomography on these objects that have very large Hilbert spaces. Um, and the key enabling technology to be able to measure that is the ability to measure photon number parity. But, um, and we'll see later how we do that. Okay, so that's control. What about measurement? Uh, well, I just showed you Wigner functions, but um, we want to look in detail about how we can measure sample from the photon number distribution. So <clears throat> we want to 
be able to ask the question, is the photon number equal to one? Yes or no? That has a one bit answer. Or is the photon number equal to 13? Yes or no? That's again, a one bit answer. Now, this is not a very efficient way to um, find out the photon number, because let's say there are 256 possible photon numbers, and you ask, is the number 13? Most of the time, the answer is no. So from an information theoretic point of view, you're gaining very little information, because almost always the answer is no. So this is inefficient. Uh, sampling or and requires large query complexity to determine what's going on. But it's let's start by understanding how we could answer this simple uh, question. And the way we do that is with a uh, uh, controlled unitary gate, which um, flips the qubit, it rotates it by pi around the x-axis, if and only if you are in the photon Fox state M. And then you measure the qubit. And if it flipped, then you the state has collapsed to photon Fox state M, and you know there were M photons. Now, how do we actually do that? Well, we use our dis strong dispersive coupling which uh, says that the energy to flip the qubit is omega q over two plus chi times the number of photons. So each time you add a photon, and chi is usually negative, each time you add a photon to the cavity, the energy to flip the qubit shifts uh, by two chi. So the spectrum of the qubit is a series of sharp lines, uh, uh, and uh, which line you get depends on how many photons are in the cavity. So if I apply a microwave tone, which is supposed to be a pi pulse to flip the qubit, and I apply it at this frequency, it will be on resonance with the qubit frequency and therefore rotate the qubit by pi if and only if there's exactly one photon in the cavity. And so that's how we would execute such a gate. Now, if you apply, you could ask a more complicated question. Is the photon number equal to either one or three? It still has a one bit answer, yes or no. But there are two cases where you could get a yes. And the way you do that is by applying two tones, one at this frequency and one at this frequency. And if the photon number is either one or three, one of these will flip the qubit. You won't know which one. All you'll know is that the qubit flipped. And therefore, uh, the photon number was either one or three. So this, with this kind of capability, it turns out you can measure any arbitrary binary function of the photon number. And it's a quantum non-demolition measurement. Ordinary photodetectors absorb the photons they're measuring. Here, we're just using the frequency shift on the atom, the qubit that the photon causes. So to understand uh, what I mean by a binary valued function of the photon number distribution, just think of a, um, a binary vector C that consists of ones and zeros. And all of the photon numbers for which the corresponding vector component is one uh, will contribute to this projector. And if the photon number is equal to any one of those values where this, where you're allowing a bit flip, then uh, you will flip the, the bit and you'll know that the photon number was one of these values where C sub M is one, but you won't know which one. So for example, it could be one or three in this case. <clears throat> so this capability lets us do a highly efficient binary search, just like in classical 
computer science, a binary search for the photon number. Uh, there is also an efficient phase estimation scheme, but this one is easier. It does not require any feed forward of the measurement results. And it's also easy to obtain the most significant bits first. So it, it uses a sequence here illustrated with four of these conditional unitaries. And uh, so it works like this. Um, you, the first measurement has this uh, binary function. So here's, here's photon number 0, 8, 16. And the fact that all of these are 1 means that this gate will flip the qubit if the photon number is in the upper half of the range between 0 and 16 or 0 and uh, uh, 15, whatever you're using. And then you make a measurement of the qubit. You haven't, you've projected the cavity into a state that uh, has eliminated either the upper half or the lower half of the set of five states that it could have been in. Then you do a second measurement with this other vector. Let's say that the first measurement determined that the photon number is in the upper half of the range you're studying. Then this measurement will tell you whether it's in the upper half or lower half. Whoops, well, I'm having a little trouble with my mouse or the lower half of this half, and so on, down to the final measurement where you find out the parity is the photon number even or odd. So this is effectively do it, carrying out the walsh hadamard transform of the photon number distribution. And by looking at the measurement results, A3, A2, A1, A0, you can form the binary digits in the measured photon numbers. So A3 is the most significant bit. If uh, A2 is different than A3, then this guy caused the gate to flip. And that determines the next bit, which is turns out given by the mod 2 sum of the two measurement results, and so on down the line. So you end up with. Uh, in this case, four bits of information um, uh, that tell you the photon number. So this is true boson sampling. It's highly efficient because the circuit depth is only log in the maximum number of photons that you're searching through. So this is, uh, this is a little tricky, so I'll stop and see if there are any questions here. Okay. All right, so now we're going to use this uh, control and measurement toolbox for hardware efficient simulation of physical models containing bosons. And in particular, we're going to do an experimental simulation of the optical spectra of vibrating triatomic molecules. Or we're going to measure the so called Frank Condon factors in the spectrum uh, as a boson sampling problem. So uh, more precisely, a Gaussian boson sampling. So in boson sampling, you have an array of beam splitters, and you put in photon Fox states in different modes, and you, you let them uh, interfere with each other, moving along these different paths. And then you measure the photon number distribution in the output. And that turns out to be, um, at least if you had uh, many, many modes and uh, many, many photons, that's uh, challenging to, um, to compute on, on a classical computer, that distribution. 
So we're going to use bosons to simulate bosons. The bosons in the molecule are their vibrations. So here's a water molecule, and we're going to focus on the symmetric stretch mode where the OH bonds are stretching and shrinking together, and the anti-symmetric bending mode where they're, they're uh, bending uh, in opposite directions. And so these are mechanical quantum oscillators, generally not harmonic, although we're going to approximate them that way. And we're going to physically represent their states by, uh, if there are n vibrational quanta in this mode, we will put n photons in this microwave cavity representing the stretch. If there are uh, p photons, phonons in the bending mode, we'll put p photons in this second microwave mode. And to control these and represent the physics of these uh, molecules, we will have three transmon and scillas uh, to uh, control and uh, mix these uh, two modes. Okay. So the way that um, the way that that this spectroscopy works is a high energy photon is sent in, and this is photo emission spectroscopy. An electron is ejected, and that uh, weakens one of the bonds, <clears throat> and changes the potential energy surface on which these uh, nuclei are moving. So there is an, a ground state, a two-dimensional ground state potential energy surface in the where the coordinates are the, the amount of um, bend and the amount of stretch. And the nuclei moving in that potential have quantized energy levels. Those are kind of phonons. And when you eject uh, an electron suddenly, then you have a completely new potential energy surface because the chemical bonds have changed and there this surface is displaced and squeezed and rotated and the, and the spring constant has changed. And you suddenly project the wave function from this state, which is an eigenstate of the old potential, into the basis of eigenstates of the new potential, and you get a variety of transitions, sometimes to here, sometimes to here, sometimes to there, each of which leaves behind in the molecule different amounts of vibrational energy. And we want to calculate the probabilities for each of those transitions, because that determines how much energy is left in the photoelectron. So in the first generation experiment that was carried out by uh, the Sholkoff lab, uh, we're going to obtain the nuclear potential energy service by solving the chemical bonding problem, the fermionic problem, on a classical computer. Uh, other people are working hard on you know, trying to solve these problems on quantum computers, but they're, they're beyond the reach of quantum computers right now. So we did it on a classical computer. We got the resulting potential energy surfaces and we approximated them as harmonic, as quadratic. But they're not, uh, uh, there's still quite a bit of um, complexity here because the, the ground state potential energy surface, which has its symmetry axes aligned with the orthogonal normal modes, bending and stretch, uh, when you go to when you break one of the chemical bonds, you no longer have that symmetry. The surface rotates its symmetry axes, it changes its curvature or spring constant, and it also displaces the origin. So we have to be able to represent that in our quantum simulator and uh, and do that, carry out the unitary transformation of the basis from the eigenstates of this harmonic pair of harmonic oscillators to that pair of harmonic oscillators. 
And uh, chemists refer to that unitary transformation as the um, Dokhtarov transformation. So what are the you know, technical requirements to do this? Well, uh, this uh, optics, quantum optics version of doing things lays it out here. You need, of course, bosonic modes. You need Gaussian operations like beam splitters, squeezing, and displacements. Uh, our, my host uh, has uh, <laughs> contributed importantly to that. And we need the beam splitter between the modes to coherently mix them, which performs a kind of rotation in this uh, space because uh, pure bend and pure stretch become uh, mixed together once you break the symmetry of the molecule and, and break one of the bonds. You need non-Gaussian state preparation because the chemist might want to know if I started with uh, two quanta in this mode and three quanta in that mode, what does the spectrum look like? And then to see how many photons or phonons you're representing are left after the sudden change in basis, you have to do have number resolved photon detection. And uh, beam splitters are easy in both quantum optics and in circuit QED, but squeezing and number resolve detection are a bit easier in, uh, than they are in conventional quantum optics if you're doing things in the microwave. So here's the circuit for the quantum simulation. There are two cavities, Alice and Bob, or uh, you know, bending and stretch. There are three ancilla transmons. We first initialize everything in the vacuum state, the ground state. Then we do some non-Gaussian state preparation, maybe put one photon in this cavity and two in that one. Then we execute this uh, unitary operation that changes the basis suddenly from, it maps these states onto linear combinations of states of the other potential energy surface. It effectively suddenly changes the spring constants, displacements and uh, uh, superpositions of normal modes in the two oscillators. Then this unitary, which requires these ancillas to help out, is supposed to leave the ancillas in the ground state. So we do a verification step to see if any of them uh, were left in an excited state. That's an error flag that suggests that the transformation probably failed. And we use that step to reject 5 to 10% of the runs because one of the ancillas has been left in the excited state. Then we carry out this number resolving, uh, photon number resolving measurements that I described to you earlier in each cavity. So that's, uh, you know, quite a few steps, but inside here, there are a lot of steps. You have uh, the transmon coupler that couples the Alice and Bob cavities to do this unitary transformation, you have to squeeze cavity A, squeeze cavity B. You have to turn on a beam splitter, which rotates the norm, mixes together the normal modes of the two cavities. Then you have to squeeze each of them again by a different amount. And then you have to displace each mode. Now, these are relatively straightforward operations, uh, natural operations in a bosonic system, quite difficult in a qubit representation, but still it's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of operations here. Uh, and here are, here are the results. So this is photoionization of a water molecule starting from the ground uh, vibrational state for the stretch and the bend. This is the theoretically exact spectrum based on our um, approximately calculated potential energy surface. 
we know the frequencies of these modes. So all we need to determine is how many quanta got excited into each mode, and that will determine how much energy was extracted from the photoelectron and left behind in the molecule. So this is that energy spectrum. You can tell we're working with chemists because uh, we're using inverse centimeter wave number units. And let's see what the quantum simulation yielded. So first, I showed you that very slow method of finding out how many photons there were in the, each cavity, which is to just ask, is the photon number one in the first cavity and seven in the second cavity or whatever? And it's slower, but it's quite accurate. And you can see quite good agreement with the um, uh, spectrum. Again, the, the frequencies are not in play, only the heights of the lines. And the L1 norm distance between the exact distribution and the measure distribution uh, is about 5%. So that's a kind of measure of the infidelity. If I do the exponentially faster um, eight bits at a time sampling, um, it's, it's 32 times faster, but because I have to make four Q and D measurements, keeping the cavity not making any errors and the ancilla not making any errors, it's, um, it's uh, it, uh, infidelity is, is a little bigger, about 15%, but it's much, much faster. So again, I want to emphasize that typical photo detectors are not number resolving. They just say there was a click or, you know, there was zero photons or, or one or more. And also they eat up the photons, they're destructive. So you can't do this trick of repeated measurements. And here we have very efficient Q and D single shot boson number sampling. And we measure which of 256 possible photon states there are in the two cavities, so, you know, 16 in each cavity. And we do that by making a series of measurements that give us the four bits in the binary representation of the uh, photon number in this cavity and the photon number in that cavity. And the circuit cost is only log in uh, the number of photon states, log of 256, not 256. So that's a gain of a uh, factor of 32 in this case. at some cost in accuracy, as I showed you. Now, so using, here's a different example with ozone and a different non-Gaussian starting state. The spectrum looks very different, but again, the agreement is fairly good. Um, and the, the advantage, the efficiency of using microwave bosons to simulate vibrational bosons is very large. If we had tried to do this simulation of boson modes, even though they're, you know, it's not a big molecule and there are only two modes, it would have required eight qubits just to hold the uh, four bits of information about the photon number and then many more bits to carry out those extremely complicated multi-qubit gates that are necessary. And it would have taken several thousand of those very complicated gates. So this is well beyond the capability of existing, uh, should I say, ordinary uh, quantum computers today, but was relatively straightforward in this apparatus that had two native boson modes, microwave cavities, and three ancilla qubits. So, um, you know, I like to say we... we we certainly haven't demonstrated quantum supremacy over classical computers, but we have over ordinary quantum computers. <laughs> All right, so, um, so the take home message is that, uh, you know, if you have, if you're simulating 
physical models containing bosons, or if you're doing error correction, it's very handy to have uh, bosonic modes in your system. It's, it's much more uh, efficient. And uh, the experiment was done by uh, Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis in uh, Rob Shulkoff's group. Uh, we talked to actual chemists. It was a huge language barrier, but it was a, after a series of many, many conversations, they taught us about uh, Frank Condon factors and molecules and how to, uh, how to calculate these things. <clears throat> Ike Schwang helped us figure out the computational complexity of the task on a qubit based um, computer. And uh, other things going on with bosonic modes uh, are also happening in the Devere lab where uh, they're being used for um, quantum error correction. And we talk to them a lot as well. So I will uh, stop there with just a brief mention of future directions. Uh, we're looking at um, the, a situation where the ground and excited potential energy surfaces actually touch at a point called a conical intersection. And that degeneracy causes the adiab born oppenheimer adiabatic approximation to fail. It's more complicated to simulate. And um, uh, this is important in the vision process in, in your eye, actually. And we wanted to use quantum phase estimation to realize um, uh, or extend our calculations to anharmonic potential energy surfaces. So those are two future directions. I'd also fantasize about uh, realizing interacting many body simulations of, of bosons. Um, and uh, we have a, we're in the middle of writing a paper on how to trick microwave photons into thinking that they're charged particles in a magnetic field and perhaps could uh, go into the fractional quantum hall uh, states and exhibit fractional of excitations that contain fractions of a photon. And uh, the way to do that is would be to build a big array of cavities and then turn on beam splitters that are phase locked. We have this way of controlling uh, beam splitters that Devon uh, uh, worked on when she was at Yale. And if you could lock the phases in such a way that when a photon, the beam splitter causes a photon to hop around a closed loop, it picks up some specified phase, then it looks like the Berry phase of a charged particle in a magnetic field. And the technology is sort of almost ready. You know, we've built uh, pairs of cavities and the beam splitter and watched individual microwave photons hop back and forth, back and forth. Um, we have uh, what are called snap gates. We have a universal control scheme that can, um, uh, cause the time evolution of this guy to be such that it looks like the photons are repelling each other, which you need. Uh, but to really realize a large lattice with faster gates and longer coherence time and so forth, we, we, you know, individual pieces of the technology are ready, but we haven't put them together in a very high fidelity uh, scheme yet. Although, Chris Wang is building a three by three array uh, right now. So uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, okay, so I'll, yeah, okay. I think I'll skip this part in the interest of time and uh, stop there and see if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for the, for the very informative talk. Um, so while we wait for the audience questions to come in, I actually have a couple of questions just to um, just uh, just to start us off. Uh, start us off. So um, you know, I, I think it's it's really it's really interesting that we can map these chemistry problems into something that we can run on our on our existing CQED devices. So um, one, like you said, there is a huge language barrier typically with this kind of mapping process. Um, and here we have a very diverse audience as well. And in some sense, I, I guess maybe could you share a little bit of, of, about how we could think about these maybe abstract quantum or condensed matter problems and you know, see if we can map it to a Hamiltonian that we can implement on a real device? 
Is there like some sort of prescription for that to think about? Yeah, <laughs> so I'm actually working with, with Nathan Weeb, who's a computer scientist uh, in our center. And we're trying to develop a kind of instruction set architecture for do executing general gates when you have a hybrid system of qubits and oscillators. And uh, Nathan has a physics background, but many computer scientists don't, you know, aren't so familiar with, uh, they're familiar with qubits, but not oscillators. And so, you know, we're trying to think about simple ways to take out a lot of the physics to just explain, you know, what the, what the, uh, what you can do, you can rotate the qubits in a way that doesn't depend on the state of the cavity. You can displace the cavity with a classical drive. You can squeeze the cavity, um, do various uh, things like this. But uh, the, the, the really interesting part comes from, it's fairly straightforward to do conditional displacements where if the ancilla is in zero, you, you give a pulse that moves the cavity in one direction in, in phase space. And if the qubit is one, you move it in the other direction. And so we're trying to, you know, define a set of gates like this and then figure out all the things you can do with them. How can you assemble them to do um, any, you know, any unitary uh, or any, you know, simulation of a physical model? Um, and yeah, it's not such familiar language to computer scientists or to chemists or you know we're still we're still uh, trying to reason about it and learn about it ourselves um and uh, the chemists you know they're physical chemists they study quantum mechanics we study quantum mechanics and we still had a language barrier so so these kind of interdisciplinary things are are more challenging than you might think and if you you know if you go further afield and start talking to you know, biologists or electrical engineers who haven't studied much quantum mechanics, then it, you know, the barriers get larger and larger. And that's one of the challenges of our whole field right now, because we need people with many, many different backgrounds to make progress on, on these very difficult problems. So we're going to have to learn to talk to each other. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Steve. I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I think uh, a lot of us are starting to realize as well. Uh, and I, I guess this is a good starting point because once we can condense everything into, I guess we, we can all go back to mathematics as a common language as a first attempt and just Hamiltonians and operators and hopefully that will get us started on, on these discussions. Um, right. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. I think the next one we have is from uh, Dimitris. I think you can go ahead and ask the question directly. Hello, good morning or good evening over there, Stephen. Hi. Great, great to uh, see you virtually again after many years. Yes, um, likewise. And very, very, very exciting stuff. I mean, first of all, one comment. I'm also very, uh, I think, going naturally in the sense of boson from bosons, fermions from fermions, and not through very complicated weird transformations that even to write them down theoretically is complicated, not to even implement them in hardware. Always, right, you know, with Jordan Wigner's, which are, uh, I mean, nice as theory, I think, uh, but tough in the NISC era is right, is the way to go. Um, one, one question on the supremacy stuff, um, it tends to be very tricky. We looked at these things recently for analog many body systems, Ising models, Bosch Hubbard models, and we tried to prove. Because even there, for some time, people, you know, great experimentalists, um, many of them have claimed that they have actually done very large systems that are clustered with classical computers, right? Like, like yeah, right. lattices with 3Ds of, of, of millions or billions of atoms, which are obviously impossible to simulate. However, the com computer science community, they have very different 
notions in complexity theory, how to really prove those things. So is there any ideas how to go about it for, for your case? I mean, I see the D versus log D, it's obvious there as well, but is there any ideas how to go and really prove those things there? Um, well, my understanding is that, um, well, there's been a huge amount of progress, let's say, in trying to model the, the group at the Flatiron Institute in New York uh, modeled the Google, you know, qubit uh, experiment with uh, tensor product states. And, you know, it's very, very low fidelity modeling, but it was still much better than the extremely low fidelity coming from the Google thing. So there was a vast efficiency gained when there are you know, errors and, and decoherence because eventually your quantum computer sort of on long length scales and time scales becomes classical. And there's some, this has been some discussion of that for the boson sampling quantum supremacy test uh, going back even to uh, Scott Aronson's early papers. I don't think it's quite as well developed and I don't know enough about matrix product and tensor product states to say whether they could efficiently represent you know the system when there's decoherence like that but that that's a um, uh, should be there should be some theoretical technique for simulating uh, even boson problems when you have decoherence because it just somehow is more classical. Yeah, yeah but yeah. yeah, we in in the bosonic case, if I have if I have like one uh, like ten seconds more, Yvonne, in the bosonic case, one way to go around is to go and play with these uh, notions of disorder and thermalization and localization. So we found a way to kind of show that the output distribution of thermalized systems is very hard to sample from in the kind of computational complexity way of hardness. And that gave us an entry point to this, uh, to this higher temple of proofs of that, you know, many- I see, this is because of uh, some volume law entropy thing? Exactly, or? exactly. Uh -huh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So when you go thermal, you get all the Hilbert space. So, so you have high, high expressibility and so on, but- I see, um, yeah. Yeah. It's anyway, known, I, I mean, it's yeah. known that the boson sampling problem is hard if you to do exactly because you have to calculate a permanent of some propagator matrix. Yeah. And yeah. and those pesky minus signs in a determinant actually make it easy to calculate determinants and permanents are hard. But it's also known that if you only need the permanent to some epsilon precision, uh, not perfectly, then it's much, much, much easier to get an approximate. You can efficiently get a good approximation. So um, that's also tied into this, um, does, does decoherence of things make it easier? But the, a good, yeah, a good simulation, let's say, of the recent experiment uh, from China, from USTC, uh, I don't, I can't remember whether anybody has tried a very, produced a very good um, tensor product or some other efficient attempt yeah. to represent that. I'm not the I think that's, yeah, it's a good question. Actually. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question, yeah. I have more, but I don't want to take over. <laughs> yeah, we have another we have another question. Uh, this is from Jiang Bin. So the question is about uh, you know as we venture out to more multidimensional systems, such as in, you know typical chemistry, real chemistry problems, um, the Hamiltonian governing these transitions or these dynamics are actually very hard to know precisely a priori. Right. So uh, if we don't know what we're looking for, then how, how do we start this kind of simulation in the first place? Um, or I, I guess my kind of addition to that question is how do we verify, you know, now we can 
run it on a classical computer and verify it's correct. Uh, but when we go to the higher dimensional, more complex systems, how, when we don't really know what we're looking for, how do we, you know, start the simulation process? And yeah, it? no, that that's a that's a good question. Or even how do you even if you think you know the Hamiltonian, how do you know if you got if your simulator worked yes. correctly? <laughs> Yeah, no, those are very, uh, those are very uh, good questions. I mean, ultimately, someday, our quantum computer will solve the fermionic problem and tell us the potential energy surface, do the whole thing, right? Um, but we're very, very far away from that. Uh, furthermore, you know, in really large molecules where the classical motion is chaotic then you know you expect the quantum motion will also be complicated you know to simulate and then tiny errors in the hamiltonian will be very serious in the, at least in the details of the result and that there's no way there's no way around that i think <laughs> um so um, but then the the spectrum is so complicated that I'm not sure what what is it you know uh, maybe the chemist doesn't really want to know all those details but more more general features to help identify the molecule in a gas spectrum or something. I mean it's a, it's a it's a complicated the the questioner has put his or her finger on a an important question about um, what's the what is the right question to ask in this situation, and uh, I'm not sure we completely completely know the answer. But certainly, as things become bigger and more complicated, if we don't have precise knowledge of the Hamiltonian, we cannot possibly do a good simulation that's certainly true mm -hmm. yeah but i guess that's a it's a good start for now with the known problems that we can still verify um so i think um just to follow that up i have another question just from me and from you know the experimental side of things um do you think there is sort of at the moment one particular limitation or bottleneck that's stopping us from doing something a bit more complex or higher quality more efficiently? Um, or is just a lot of little things that needs to continuously improve uh, together? Well, it is a lot of little things, but I would, I, here in, in my view is the grand challenge for these hybrid systems. You know, you can build a microwave cavity that will store photons for two seconds you know people would build superconducting accelerator technology can do that how do you control that beautiful oscillator with a lifetime of two seconds you can't you need a transmon or some other anharmonic object in order to get universal control and the best qubits we have have you know maybe a two or 300 microsecond lifetime. So your controller, you want to control this beautiful cavity with a very ugly controller. And uh, thinking of ways to do kind of fault tolerant control to me is the big challenge. So the, the, when we're doing these operations with squeezing and beam splitters and um all the measurements um the thing that's the dominant source of error is the ancilla errors in the ancilla and so uh there are a few tricks that uh um are in use now but we, we still don't have a really good solution to this problem so that that's that's the dominant source of error and the thing we have to figure out how to fix. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I think we have, uh, we're pretty much at the end of the, the time we have. Are there any other last questions from the audience before we, um, um, we end the session today? 
I think we have a hand raised from John. You can go ahead and um, unmute to ask the question yourself. All right. Uh, thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful talk. Uh, apologies, this is a very naive um, question. I come more from a computer science background than a physics no, background. Fine. But <laughs> um, so I, I find it incredibly fascinating. There's already this idea for a, a hybrid um, DV CV system. Um, what exactly was kind of the motivation for that? Because I, I did see like, okay, so you have this kind of advantage with um, error correction. You mentioned we have this ability to, um, in a sense, kind of figure out if the unitary we applied was erroneous in some sense, or if it had to be rejected. Um, is there another kind of immediate application um, besides what I see here with uh, trying to find the uh, vibronic spectra? Sure, well, uh, let me just, uh, I didn't really talk about error correction, uh, but, um, bosonic codes where you use the large Hilbert space of the oscillator to make your code words and to repl um, they're, they're the only setup that have actually reached the break even point where the error correction made things better rather than worse. It's very, very hard to do that with qubit codes. Like let's say the shore code, maybe you're familiar with, it has nine physical qubits <laughs> to represent one logical qubit. And you have to, there are um, 20, 28 possible error states because you can have no error or you can have pally X, Y, or Z on each of the nine qubits. That's 28 error states. You have to make measurements to figure out which of those 28 things happened using complicated uh, measurements with lots of ancilla qubits to do it. And you can't make any mistakes while you're make, doing that. <laughs> and then you have to fix the error, right? And you have to do it very quickly because the code only corrects one error and you, you got to get it fixed before the next error happens. So nobody has come close to, to doing that yet. Whereas with an oscillator, you have many, uh, a large Hilbert space, but only a single physical object, which by the way, is an empty box <laughs> filled with vacuum. <laughs> so it's, it has no moving parts. It just has photons trapped inside. And there's a single dominant error, which is amplitude damping, losing photons. And so uh, you, there's only a single uh, stabilizer that you need to measure, let's say for many of these codes, which is the photon number parity, which we happen to be able to do well. And so it's just um, the error correction problem just turns out at least in the current era to be vastly simpler when you store your information in bosons rather than qubits. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful explanation. Uh, relative newcomer to the field. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I think with that, we can conclude the session today. Thank you again, Steve, very much for a wonderful talk. And thank you everyone for tuning in uh, in the morning. So um, yeah, I think um, we can end off here and, uh, and uh, virtually uh, give a round of applause to our speaker. Well, thank you very much. Thank and thanks for the great questions. I enjoyed the conversation and I, I hope we can uh, see each other in person uh, <laughs> sometime soon. Indeed, indeed. All right. Well, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.